being with the tobacco institute do you go along with what the surgeon general said do you don't do you not agree that uh, there is a link between lung cancer and cigarette smoking jack you use the right word there's a statistical link however yeah. it's not causally shown Beyond that, nobody commands anybody to smoke in our society. It is the very kind of freedom of choice issue. The precious freedom of choice, if it's going to be denied to smokers, the next day will be denied to some other group. And ultimately, Jack, what we're afraid of, and one would say, okay, why is the cigarette industry putting up this counterattack? Your sales are steadily up, what do you care? But if there is success on the part of these vigilantes, the shower adjusters that I mentioned earlier, in banning smoking in one public place, believe me, they'll try for the place next door and the place next door, the next legislative session after that. The wife must either take up smoking or resolve to live in a perpetual stinking torment. King James, the first of England. The American people would be better served if high government officials abandon the pretenses and sham battles of so-called wars against diseases and their alleged causes. The process of making public policy is better served when scientific controversy... It was PR, 100% PR. And it's not to say that some of the science they were funding in the basic sciences was not good science, sure. You know, you can fund basic, but it had nothing to do with the smoking issue. And all they were trying to do was, you know, they would funnel literally hundreds of millions of dollars into research over the, you know, two, three, four decades, um, simply for public relations purposes. Telling us that there is no link, is that correct? I am saying that the science to date and over a hundred million dollars of our industry indicates that there is no causal link. That's what I am advised, and I am not a scientist, Mr. Waxman. These are boxes of the Tobacco Institute. These boxes, uh, the white boxes, are boxes of the Council for Tobacco Research. an example of a product that represents one of America's largest farm crops and one of the most controversial consumer articles. What does this product contain and how does it affect those who use it? Here is a scientifically designed apparatus for collecting the content of the smoke under controlled conditions. By the time the researchers began to look at this in earnest was around the, uh, was really in the early 1950s and the tobacco companies are documents that uh, show that they were tracking some of this research as early as the 1940s. Cigarette tars consist of a variety of substances which can be further separated chemically. Here are some of the more important constituents of cigarette tars. All smoke, including cigarette smoke, contains some carbon monoxide, a poisonous gas that combines readily with the hemoglobin of the red blood cells and prevents it from absorbing oxygen in the lungs and giving it off to the tissues. R.J. Reynolds, a scientist there by the name of Claude Teague, uh, was uh, commissioned basically to do a survey of the literature that existed. And he pulled together a document in uh, 1953 uh, called the Survey of Cancer that looked at the evidence that existed in different uh, areas related to the question of whether smoking caused cancer. He was a chemist, so he also looked at what was known about what was in cigarette smoke and in the tar in terms of the constituents and whether there was any evidence of cancer-causing chemicals. The main bottom line conclusion, in 1953, 
from a major tobacco company was smoking caused lung cancer, at least in heavy smoking males. That report was stamped confidential, it was never published in the medical literature. It only was revealed after documents were uh, made available through some of the litigation that occurred in the late 1990s in the United States. And I think that really sets the tone for what we know uh, transpired with regards to the industry over the next 50 years, of what they were going to tell the public and how they were going to work with medical doctors who were studying and seeing the effects in their patients of smoking and health and um, how they were going to maintain their business. Record the influence of nicotine upon the body temperature. In this experiment, we see that the skin temperature gradually... Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnston. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. This is Timothy V. Hartnett, former president of a major tobacco firm and chairman of the Industry Research Committee. Mr. Morrow, I would like to quote from a statement released at the time the Tobacco Industry Research Committee was formed. At that time, we stated we accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other consideration in our business. And that's where we stand today. One of the things that we do in the lab is to basically reverse engineer cigarettes. When filter cigarettes came out, they were advertised as a way to reduce sort of irritation, reduce, um, reduce nicotine, reduce tar, and all of these would sort of have implicit, explicit associations with, with health effects. So you're reducing irritation, you're reducing that sort of smoked out feeling, as some Philip Morris ads used to say. Your attention, please. Here is the most important disclosure ever made about cigarettes, based on a scientific fact published in leading medical journals. Philip Morris, and only Philip Morris, is entirely free of a source of irritation used in all other leading cigarettes. So stop worrying about cigarette irritation. Start smoking for pleasure. That sort of line of advertising continued into the light cigarette era after the 1964 Surgeon General's report when there was evidence that even people who had switched to filtered cigarettes still had an excess risk of lung cancer. The cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. In 1964, there was no argument going on. Uh, in fact, there was no argument even within the industry in 1958. Uh, yet, these organizations continued to create and perpetrate the myth that there was a controversy. Uh, we, we do talk to the question of whether or not cigarettes are hazardous. We do not believe that cigarettes are hazardous. We don't accept that. Have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Coleman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe because when, as and if, any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health, we are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. True, the babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the babies born from women who do not smoke. 
What about the higher and rate some of women deaths? would prefer having smaller babies. Out. Has anyone, to your knowledge, ever died of the effects of smoking cigarettes? His answer then was no, and I would like to find out what his answer is now. All right, I'll just call on him because that's the purpose of his presence here to ask to answer those questions, Dr. Kastenbaum. I remember the question, first of all. Sir. I remember the question. You're yes. The I don't remember the answer specifically. I'm sure you have it on tape. To your knowledge, has anyone ever died of the effects of smoking? I think that there are many reports in the scientific literature to this effect. And if many that's reports to, what effect? to the effect that people have died. That's right. I think that there are other reports in the scientific literature to the opposite effect. Which do you uh, believe to be true? Well, I, uh, I think that uh, there is a controversy here, as we've indicated. I think that if the company as a whole believed that cigarettes were really harmful, we would not be in the business. Uh, we're a very uh, moralistic company. I think the management of Philip Morris is sincere in this position. I think there's a great deal of doubt as to whether or not cigarettes are harmful. If you read both sides, not only the point of view of the people who, are, who have missionary zeal to make the world stop smoking, but the people who are trying to be objective with respect to this question, you will discover there's a great deal of doubt with regard to whether or not smoking causes all these diseases which are alleged to be caused by smoking. Here's our, the DVD collection. So this is what we transferred from tape into the DVDs or in the cabinets here. Here's the thing, the tobacco industry was always creating their own media when they were out doing these speakers bureaus. Okay, here, well here's good stuff. This is um, tapes called the Tobacco College of Knowledge, um, or College of Tobacco Knowledge. And that was a actual course that they put together for people in the industry sellers um, to actually teach them how to speak the jargon of the public relations that was going on with tobacco, how to talk about tobacco. Teach you how to lie. To introduce my ultimate boss, or the man through whom flows the power of our ultimate bosses, namely you, the member <laughs> companies of the Tobacco Institute. But I simply want to say welcome to the Tobacco Institute uh, College of Tobacco Knowledge. Uh, we at the Institute uh, take great pride, as I hope is coming through to you, in planning for these seminars, these colleges, these uh, uh, meetings, or whatever you want to call them. Why should the public believe you as opposed to believing the Surgeon General and all the doctors and the reports from the government? David, I don't think it's quite so much a matter of believing us versus someone else. It's believing what the facts are. This is pretty conclusive evidence on the part of a conservative Surgeon General. When will the Tobacco Institute face up to the facts that smoking is indeed not only hazardous, but it causes a lot of death in this country? Tom, I think what we're talking about here is what is... They were there to go and create doubt, create debate. They couldn't lose. If you got a local physician who was not trained in debate, they were professional, they could confuse anyone. We have contributed nearly $100 million to research over the years because we believe we are obligated, because we have produced a product that has been alleged to cause death and disease, we are obligated to try to find those answers. That the evidence is overwhelming that they should quit smoking. Why would they do that? I have no doubt that Dr. Richmond is sincere in his beliefs, and there are many sincere men and women of science who disagree with his judgment. The industry hadn't yet quite yielded to the fact that the data were there. Dr. Richmond is, is, is a physician, he's the Surgeon General of the United States. His name is on this 1,200-page uh, report, and the government has continued to say this now for all. What would be their motives for telling the American people that the evidence is overwhelming that they should... But they were still successful with the public. See, in, in creating and, uh, this notion. Here are men and women of science who disagree. As I'm sure you're aware, health alarms based on statistical studies are by no means limited to cigarettes. 
two Chicago doctors implicated fresh air as a health hazard, claiming it leads to insomnia and nightmares. Apricots have been questioned because of their cyanide component. Beetle nut chewing was linked with intestinal cancer. Old the whole notion of it was they had a team of people led by a guy named Walker Merriman. They had Bill Dwyer, they had Connie Drath, and they had another woman, I forget her name, Ann Browder. The jury has not come in. It may not be harmful. You're not convinced. It may be or it may not be. We don't know. How can you say it might not be harmful, yet most of the people who die of lung cancer smoke? C. Everett Coop, Surgeon General of the United States, will come back with a discussion on tobacco and restaurants and cities. Then you had this Bill Dwyer on from the Tobacco Institute on the Larry King Show. And, uh, and I leaned back in one of these breaks and I said, how can you say these things? to this was to Dwyer, this is criminal, you can't get away with this. He says, doctor, this is showbiz. More cigarettes every year, thank you. To... I've done it, JP. I've done it. Look. We gave this mouse the residue from smoking one Hambar cigarette, and it didn't die. There, you see, what did I tell you? <laughs> Oh, well, back to the lab. So we've got here is the uh, tobacco repository. Cigarettes packaged in plastic wrapped in cellophane. They keep them frozen in here. It's minus 20 Celsius in here, which is about zero Fahrenheit. industry is involved in funding science and you know they're doing the public relations can it be trusted and I think the answer is no many of the experiments underway today in laboratories medical schools and other research centers would not be possible but for the funding of tobacco manufacturers for that reason alone science includes those who have cautioned that if smoking were not available some smokers might exhibit increased stress Stress, of course, is cited in much of the scientific literature as a factor likely to be involved in human disease causation. Please check with the corporate headquarters before disseminating this tape and do not use this in communicating our position to those outside the company. Over the years, they could, they could rely on this for public relations purposes, and they did. I mean, Philip Morris used to publish brochures every year saying how many millions of dollars they gave to research, and they would list some of their grantees. Uh, but they were also using it for their own protection. So when it came time to litigation, they had a steady stream of expert witnesses just like that. They just had to go to their own grantees. A person who is smoking such as her father uh, had the capability of stopping if he believed he could stop and if he wanted to stop and if someone didn't tell him that he was addicted to cigarettes. I mean, somebody told him he was addicted and therefore he believed it? I think. I think that that's a component, and that's really the reason I'm here today. Do you, you don't believe, Dr. Slade, that people are addicted to cigarettes because somebody told them they're addicted and therefore they talk themselves into it, do you? That's nonsense. Nicotine causes Absolute nicotine nonsense. addiction. Absolute nonsense, Dr. Raffle. I'm just really astounded to hear a, a person come here and say that who has presumably some scientific background. The preponderance of scientific evidence, study after study after study, and government study after government study, certainly draws a correlation between cigarette smoking and any number of diseases, does it not? The point is that the tobacco industry has spent over $120 million in independent, arm's length research. So when we talk about the preponderance of research, we say that there are studies that unfortunately are never published. There are a vast number of scientific reports in Congress on file 
supporting the fact that it is an open case, not a closed case. The tobacco industry has been amply represented. They have plenty of money. They can buy full-page ads to get their point of view across. The time now is not for debate. The time is for action. You're here going out throughout the state. You are a paid representative to go around the state to create confusion in the public's mind, literally, about this issue. There should be no confusion. There are carcinogens in tobacco smoke. People have the you. right to breathe Why? air that's let's, clean. Let's, let's respond. Yeah. To that. Why are you here? Well, I am here very clearly because what we believe to be true... Who's we? A whole group of the scientific community that are all very concerned about the total quality of indoor air. Yes, Sir, in, I'm a scientist. The, You're a public relations expert. You I'm always say that. that. to just finish what I was trying to say when they cut me off. There are not a dozen studies. There's about 300 studies on the effects of passive smoking. Uh -huh. The conclusion of every independent scientific body in the world, including the World Health Organization, is that passive smoking is a cause of disease in non-smokers. Like other workers, the flight attendants cannot step outside for a breath of fresh air when the air is full of cigarette smoke. We are truly hostages at 35,000 feet who are being subjected to pulmonary rape by the passengers who smoke. This was, this was a nightmare. This, there was nothing, nothing at all about this fight that was fun. And the airlines would call me in and say, this is nobody else's problem but yours. And if you don't like it, we think you need to find another job. And I looked at my son, I'm going to have to be dead to stop this fight. Dead. I'm a smoker, and I have to deal with people of all kinds every day. Now, I share the concern of the Tobacco Institute, the sponsors of this film, about how smokers and non-smokers get along. Uh, pardon me. The man at the front desk said you have a non-smoking seat for me. I'm working on it. I won't sit in the smoking section. I understand. Miss, I'll move. Thank you very much. People like him can be very difficult. The folks at the airlines pretty much agree. It's a tiny group of people who cause such problems. You work for and promote, on behalf of the tobacco industry, a product that you know yourself in your own heart is very, very harmful. How can you do that? I can promote a point of view for an industry because I think everyone deserves representation because I believe that if people don't speak out on behalf of the tobacco industry people like Aaron are going to put that industry out of business and freedom of choice is going to go down the tubes with it. I, I wish I could but have you ever admitted any harm associated with tobacco smoke to non-smokers or smokers? It have can you irritate non-smokers absolutely harm, and I disease, think that smokers death, need to Brennan. make that choice. Give, I am them, not here. give them the facts and well, don't and distort and deny all the massive medical evidence that you distort. We're talking about an area of scientific uncertainty. And I think it's something that Congress really does not need to spend its time on since, quite clearly, the public is very aware of what the government has said about smoking and health over the years. The phrase, far from unanimous, isn't that really sort of a smokescreen? There is no controversy, is there, over the medical effects caused by smoking? Mr. Cornegay, you represent a very powerful institution. The Tobacco Institution has successfully, uh, as a lobby, fought off any legislation by any agency of government that could look at health and safety questions related to the cigarette. Now we have people saying that uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission ought to be allowed just to do a study without anything further than that. Is that, does it seem reasonable that your lobby ought to be able to prevent simply a study from going forward? Well, of course, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how powerful uh, the tobacco lobby is. I read, I guess, the same newspapers you do in many instances. Uh, but the only answer I can give you to that is that uh, uh, the tobacco industry at times has uh, uh, had accusations placed against it that really don't hold up when you come in and look at all of the facts. We have a now, that's not agency. power. That's dealing with understandable, reasonable people. We have a government agency that has the job of protecting the public from unsafe products, and they can look at every product that's unsafe and evaluate whether there's anything they can do about it, but they can't even look at your product to determine whether it's unsafe and whether something can be done to make it safer.